Chapter 6 Sidon Horses will be of little use in the forest. Val hitched a rucksack of supplies to his shoulders later that morning. We'll go by foot. May the gods be with you, Annette said, handing Cody a package of hardtack which he stuffed in his own rucksack before slinging it up onto his back. Full of provisions, blankets, and water skins, the rucksacks towered over their own heads, but Hale was glad for the supplies, grateful for anything that would aid in their survival. To that end, Pathis had fitted them with additional weapons— a hand axe for Cody, a short sword for Caitlin, and a shield for Val. There were even saddlebags to throw over the elk. The elk did not seem to mind the burden. Instead, he was eager to set off, huffing, scraping the ground, and shaking his head in the direction of the forest, south. We're coming, we're coming, Cody said, then admonished himself, mumbling, I can't believe I'm talking to an elk. There were hearty thanks, hugs, backslaps, and not a few tears on the part of Annette. There, there. They are in good hands, Pathis said, extending an arm around his wife. Finally, Val led them out through the back fence into the fields, where the morning fog was lifting. The elk danced out in front of them and set a brisk pace. Hale hoped this would not be their pace for the entire journey— his breath was already coming hard, and his load felt heavier than he had imagined. Cody whistled a tuneless melody, while Hale and Caitlin turned back and gave one last wave to the couple that had shown them such hospitality. However, when they turned, the mist had already descended again, closing them off and leaving Hale to feel that they were the last people left in all the plains. Cultivated fields gave way quite quickly to wild ones— in places, spools of hay had been rolled across the fields, but never harvested. Now they were flattened and compressed into small mounds, where weeds and trees had taken root. Hale guessed that farmers must have come here to sow a field when they had no other choice than to leave their own fallow for a year. They had come just within night's reach to sow and roll, but for some reason never returned. There were no signs of habitation for the whole of the morning, but the grass was thick, the soil soft and loamy underfoot. Fertile lands, Cody said at one point, rolling a clod of dirt between his fingers. By midday, the morning mist had burned off. It was a clear day with bright sun that was a respite from the cold, but Val did not welcome it. Makes our trail easier to find for Twenge and his men. Do you think they're still following us? Caitlin asked. Without a doubt. Once Twenge gets a whiff of a trail, he does not abandon it easily. Used to be an inquisitor when he was younger. Still harbors the same fanaticism. It's why the High Council hired him as a tracker. He's seen more of my brothers to cells and to graves than anyone else. So the Knights of Oban are still hunted. I would have thought the High Council has better things to do. Caitlin said. The High Council does not easily forget those who betray it, Val said. The talk of politics was not interesting to Hale. He noticed that the elk had come to a stop and was waiting for them. Azure was perched in the bracken of his antlers, while Cyan and Sapphire wheeled in the breeze overhead. Hale looked beyond to what he thought was a bank of clouds low on the horizon, but then the shapes coalesced, and he understood with a shiver what he was looking at. It's the forest, he said. The others came to a stop beside him. The edges of the trees were blurry and indistinct, like a distant forest in a painting. Hale struggled with perspective until he realized that the trees were actually still distant, more than a few leagues, and what he was looking at were just the tops— rising the way a ship's sail appeared first over the horizon. They must be huge. They are, Val said, falling into step behind the elk once more. Hale watched the trees carefully as they continued. The elk checked their approach, turning them, so that they marched to the southwest, approaching the forest at an angle. For a moment, Cody hung back. Shouldn't we be going directly towards the trees? We are no longer in our own element, Val said. 
I'm following the elk. They closed the distance between the forest and themselves throughout the afternoon, until they were marching with it along their left. Hale's fear of the place diminished, with the knowledge that they were no longer headed directly into its depths. Fear was replaced by simple wonder, as Hale and Caitlin strained their necks to look up at the trees, which were higher than the turrets on the castle and easily as thick. Birds and bats floated from one treetop to another in the canopy. The main growth of the woods consisted of thick trunks, with thin, peeling bark that revealed the shiny ebony wood Pathis had mentioned. Here the wood was live, and the branches thick and knotted, like the muscles on a giant's arms. The crotches of the trees were so wide and expansive that a small forest of bushes and brambles sprouted there, like hair in an armpit. Each large tree had a dozen or so smaller ones, perhaps the size of a normal tree anywhere else, growing like saplings beneath. It was breathtaking. In a place with so many stories of death surrounding it, Hale had not expected so much life. They traveled along the edge of the forest in the shade of the trees. The forest wall was impenetrable. Leathery leaves and thorns the size of daggers barred their way. Hale drew his sword, eager to test its blade and slash away forward, but Val stopped him. We won't disturb the wood unless we must, Val said. Come on, let's keep after the elk. Hale marched on without question along the edge of the forest. As he listened to the sounds of the creatures from the woods and watched the large bats circling overhead, Hale realized just how different this place was, and was secretly relieved to postpone their entrance further. He felt an element of trespass in their plan. If no one had entered the woods and returned alive, perhaps that was a precedent they should respect. Hale watched an enormous bird with a long neck of a vulture and black featherless head step off a branch, which bounced from the relief of such weight. The creature flew with slow, lumbering wing strokes, then elicited a deep, sonorous call, closer to a frog's croak than a bird song. The sound was answered from all trees around. Hale shook off a chill. Caitlin looked back at him, fear registering in her eyes. He put on as brave a face as he could, but then tripped on a tree root and nearly tumbled over. That is right, he said as Caitlin caught his hand in hers. We are out of our element here. The sun turned blood red before them, then sank into slate clouds. Darkness and cold air rushed out of the forest like cold breath laden with smells of mildew, dust, and rot. Just before it was dark enough for the stars to come out, they came upon a break in the foliage where the jays waited silently in the branches. A narrow path led into the forest like a crack in a cliff wall. Its presence seemed as unlikely as their own. Hale looked around for the elk, expecting him to be near the entrance. Instead, he was leaping over the tall stalks of weeds and bushes moving north. Where is he going? Hale asked. Leading us to a place to rest, I imagine, Val said. Night is no time to enter the forest, Cody added, following the elk. Val was right. The elk waited for them alongside a creek, where they refilled their water skins and spread their blankets out for the night. They lit no fire, and although they had seen no one following them during the day, Val insisted that he and Cody take turns on watch. Hale had trouble sleeping on the hard ground, and each time he closed in on sleep, some noise, real or imagined, from the forest would wake him. When he finally did drift off, he dreamt he was back in the starlit room, where Garn, the farmer who had helped them escape from Lady Annabeth's manor in Kinth, had found his dead daughter, Aurora, waiting for them. Hale approached Aurora in his dream as he had in life, with an outstretched hand, trembling over her dead body. But this time, Caitlin was not there to intervene. It was upon him to touch Aurora, to heal her. He lowered his hand, his flesh a darker hue than her own bone-white skin which had grown paper-thin, so that he could see the dead vessels and withered muscles just below. 
just before he placed his fingers on her forehead, before he broke that barrier between what was living and what was dead, she moved. Her arm jerked up and seized his wrist in a grip that defied her size. Hale made to cry out but found his lungs empty, his breath stolen. He looked to his own hand, the tendons cording, his fingers clenched as he fought to free himself, but Aurora only pulled him closer to her skeletal face, that was now animated, her eyes open deep as the night sky. Her mouth moved, a thousand voices coming out at once, then joining into one. She is near. Hale jerked awake. Cody's black shape was seated at the edge of their patch of flattened grass where they were sleeping, his face turned away to the north, oblivious to Hale and his night terror. Hale looked to the other side of their camp, against the backdrop of the stars that rested like a cloud over the tangled darkness. The elk was standing, staring at him. As soon as the sky lightened, Val woke them for a breakfast of dried apples and hardtack. Once they had eaten, there was no more delay. They shouldered their packs and marched straight into the mouth of Sidon. It was the air that was most remarkable. It was thick with moisture and smells. There was even a warmth to it that felt summer-like in comparison to the days of wintry cold they had endured for so long. After all of Pathis' stories, Hale had almost expected to be set upon the moment they entered in the forest by bloodthirsty creatures or mind-crushing fear, neither of which was the case. They continued on unmolested, the jays even flitting from branch to branch above, singing out sweet notes to one another. The woods swallowed most of the light of the day, so that the place was dim as a moonlit night, but not as colorless. Despite the black leaves of the largest trees, there was an assortment of greens and even blues that permeated the space, mainly from the smaller varieties of trees that fought for prominence in the space just over their heads. Along the roadside grew bushes of red, which Hale reached out to touch with his sword. They clanged loudly against the metal. Beneath their leaves, their bark was hard as teeth. Beyond them, beyond the road, the woods yielded no more. The growth was as impenetrable as when they looked upon it from outside, if not more so, for here vines rose up from the clutter of the floor and hung as thick as trees themselves from the highest boughs above. Some smaller trees that had the misfortune of being the hosts to these vines had been bent and crushed in their grip. The noises they made, hoofbeats, bird tweets, and the shared word here and there, were muffled, and did not travel any farther than the barrier of foliage that walled in the road. It was just as well. The woods imposed silence, demanded it. Once they were quiet, Hale realized that the forest itself was full of sounds. Clicks, songs, even throbbing, which was something like distant thunder, but with the regularity of a fading heartbeat. For the moment, however, the noise inspired more wonder than fear. They tracked along the road for hours, but it didn't feel like they went anywhere. The path twisted and rose so that there was only a small portion visible at a time, and it was impossible to look back and judge one's progress, for each turn looked no different from the last. Sometimes the woods would open up, vines would thin, and so would the medium-sized trees, so that they were looking into great clearings, where mists floated about the round columns of the immense black trunks. Hale came upon these places with an expectant feeling, certain that such a change in the foliage meant something was ahead, perhaps a pond, a lake, or even a ruin. But that was never the case. The larger trees closed in again, the vines returned, and the forest retained its secrets. Sometime in the late morning, Hale could only guess it was still morning, for the sun was lost. They heard the patter of what sounded like feet overhead. The jays gave out cautious twerps, and Hale turned to look. He saw a tree branch shaking, much in the same way it would after a squirrel had run across it. But he saw nothing that could have left it shaking so. Caitlin noticed it, too, and reached down to the handle of her short sword. They are harmless. Val said. 
but ugly, Cody added. What are? Caitlin shuffled her feet to catch up to Val, who followed right behind the elk. I suspect we will see in the next clearing, Val said. Up ahead, Hale could see pale daylight filtering onto the road from a break in the foliage. At first, he saw nothing, except a few waving vines and nodding branches. Then, against the bark of one of the great trees, he saw something gold. He gave a gasp. Before he could say a thing, he went silent, for he saw another. Now he watched the creature's progress by the branches and vines it disturbed. There was another break in the foliage, and he saw its body clearly. It was clearly an animal, about the size of a cat, and yet it had two legs and two arms like a man. The pathways were remarkable. The creature could run along the branches as if they were trails and bridges. Hale was used to seeing squirrels travel so, but to see creatures whose walks mimicked humans was more striking. There was a commotion right before them. Two of the creatures had slid down vines and stared back at them. The sight was disconcerting. Their faces were animal, with hair and leathery skin, but they also looked vaguely human, with round, forward-facing eyes. They were hideous, only because they were close to human and yet clearly not. There was no question that they were studying them, with what level of intelligence Hale could not guess, but he would have preferred creatures that just ran away, terrified. The jays took up perches deep inside the elk's antlers. What are they? Caitlin asked. Tree walkers, Val said, turning and falling back in line behind the elk. Aptly named, Hale said, a bit glad they were leaving. As he looked over his shoulder, he saw that the two creatures had scampered onto the road and watched them from behind. Then, with a few hoots, which were answered from the trees far above, they leapt back into the bushes. Cody's right. They are hideous, Hale said. Only because you are not used to them. You look the same way to them, I'm sure, Val added. He imagined Val was right. The intelligence of the creatures was fascinating to him. No one back in Antis would even believe him if he tried describing them. But the more he thought about them the more his fears of the forest were assuaged. If these were the most hideous creatures the woods had to offer, he truly had little to fear. And if these small tree walkers, with no quills, spikes, or fangs, could live in the trees, playing about, indulging their curiosity at strange passerby, how dangerous could Sidon be? Maybe the legends and stories of Sidon were overly embellished. For the first time, Hale felt that their journey would be uneventful. Perhaps there was a chance that he and his friends had somehow stumbled onto the one lost path right through Sidon and would emerge on the other side, proof that the stories were only that, stories. They continued onward. The forest had become monotonous, and to fight boredom, Hale and Caitlin exchanged riddles. She was much better at them than he. Even with Cody's help, she stumped him more often than not. They ate a midday meal while on the move and pushed forward until early evening when the little light that filtered down in the woods began to fade. Hale's feet hurt, and Caitlin was scuffing the soles of her boots with each step. Can we stop to rest? Hale asked Val. Not yet, not here. The smell of the forest has gone foul, Val said. Hale took a deep breath. He could only smell the same mildew, sage, and charcoal scents that had accompanied them on the entire journey. If anything, he felt that he could detect a new odor, one that was sweet, like candy. He wondered what kind of tree bud or flowering plant made such a smell. What do you mean? I smell a pleasant perfume here. Yes, Val said. I noticed that. He shrugged. Well, I suppose we have already walked a great distance. We can rest. Since it was dinner time, they indulged in some smoked beef and honey cakes that were going to go stale if they did not eat them. Caitlin surprised them with a small jar of raspberry jam that Annette had packed for them. Caitlin, Cody, and Hale spread it on the cakes as a dessert, the jays fluttering down among their feet to pick at the crumbs like hens in a barnyard. The jam brought Hale back to the comfort of Pathis and Annette's home. 
for their first day in the forest, he thought things had gone quite well. Val, why don't you join us? Hale said. Val was a few steps farther down the path, sniffing the air. You don't smell that? It's almost like something... dead. It's the woods, Cody said. Something's always dying, rotting. Val relented, sat, and bit off a piece of smoked beef. The ease and comfort Hale was remembering from Pathis and Annette's was making him feel relaxed and safe. Combined with the long day of marching, he soon felt drowsy. His lids fluttered, but he snapped them open and jerked his head back. Hale knew he should not fall asleep so soon. They would surely march a little farther after dinner. He turned and looked about for something interesting to study to keep him awake. One of the black vines he had seen before hung nearby him. He leaned close. It was moist with some viscous oil. White hairs poked through the fluid, and beads of the substance hung on their ends. Hale's breathing must have been harder than he thought, for the branch jerked suddenly. He held his breath, but the vine moved again on its own. A slight tremor that followed all the way up into the boughs where it came from. Odd. He turned back to his jam and cake and finished them. His hunger quite satiated, he leaned back, relaxed. A quick nap would not hurt, he decided. After all, the others would wake him if he slept too long. Hale yawned. It would just be a brief nap. In Sidon, of all places, how shocked everyone would be when he told them he had slept there. He leaned his head back and closed his eyes. In his dream, he pictured himself being cradled, rocked gently. Strong arms held him from all directions. What a pleasure to be looked after with such care. Was this a memory? The answer seemed to be no. Somewhere he remembered there had only ever been one person who had cared for him so, and she was quite distant. Was that a feminine voice telling him to wake up? He shook his head. Now the gentle touches turned firm, even hurtful. This did remind him of a memory, one he had forgotten, being a toddler and strapped to his crib during storms. It was not until Yana had come that they had stopped the practice. He did not want to remember it. It was time for this nap, this dream to end. Now he felt a tight sensation around his body. He could not move. He fought. Along with all this was music. A chirping he at first thought was soothing, for it was familiar, but then, as the strangling increased, he realized it was an urgent, desperate melody. The sound now seemed to be something he could feel against his face. He went to wave it away, but his hand was stuck. Now his paralysis panicked him. His dream was a nightmare. He strained to wake up, but his eyelids were heavy. It was like lifting leaden shades. Finally, they came unglued. There was a mass of angry, squeaking feathers flying at his face, trying to wake him. At first he thought he must still be dreaming, for when he looked down, he realized the forest floor was far below. Then he saw Cody next to him, doubled over, held in the air from the waist, black shapes coiled about his body, his face relaxed and unconscious. Cody! he cried out. He shifted, a fly caught in a spider's web. A petite hand dangled next to his face. He could not turn any more to see her, but he knew it was Caitlin hanging alongside him. The vines, he choked out. The very vines he had noticed before had wrapped them all in a cocoon of sorts. He struggled, his mind still slow as if he were drunk. He whipped his body about. Some vines came loose, but they were strangely powerful and persistent. One slithered across his face, and a deep whiff of the oil on them made him dizzy with sleep again. But sapphire slamming into his face roused him. He kicked again. The vines gave him an angry shake and squeeze. The pressure was excruciating, his breath coming hard. He continued to rise into the trees. Now he could smell the foul air Val had mentioned, a rotting, vomit-inducing odor. Tears of panic blurred Hale's vision. As he blinked them away, he recoiled. He was high up in the boughs now, where it was darker, but even in the dim light he could see broken faces looking back at him. 
At first, he thought they were human, for they had the same eye sockets and square-toothed mouths, even blonde hair still sticking to the places where flesh remained. Then he realized they were too small. These were the bodies of the tree walkers, crushed in the embrace of other vines, so many other vines twisted around them, their faces wee, corroded, and skeletal, but each one looked anguished and surprised. One had a vine that snaked into its mouth and out its eye, as if the vine was in search of the secrets trapped in the creature's mind. As his gaze darted around, he saw other animals of varying sizes and shapes, a deer-like creature, a warthog, rodents, all in various states of decay, bones protruding, fur falling, skin going taut, mouths open in silent screams, answered only by the engulfing greed of the vines. Farther down, Hale could see Val asleep in the middle of the road, the vines slithering about him too. Only the elk had been unaffected, but he was behind a curtain of the vines that darted and snapped at him like snakes. He slashed at them with his antlers, but for each one he cut, two more would slip past and try to wrap his legs. Hale cried out Val's name, but the captain did not stir. The elk turned his head, and Hale heard a voice. Your sword! Hale was not sure whose voice it was, Val's or perhaps Cody's, but he remembered his sword, Elkhart. His hand was pinned, but it was close to the handle. He was not sure what good it would do, but he pulled on the cross guard with his fingers, and he heard the blade slide from its scabbard. The bully of the vines released his grip, almost dropping Hale completely. Hale snatched the sword before he tumbled to the ground. The vines were whipping off him so quickly, he had to grab a limp one in order to keep from falling. He held himself up with one arm and swung the sword with the other. Even those vines he did not touch went limp just in its proximity. He turned and swung towards Caitlin. The vines unfurled, rolling her gently down to the ground. Hale put his legs together and shifted his weight towards Cody. With a swing of the blade, the vines relaxed around him as well, lowering him back to the place in the road where they had eaten and slept in the first place. Hale slid down a limp vine, hit the ground, and rushed over to the elk and Val. He flew recklessly into the vines. He didn't care. He swung the sword with abandon, and this time the vines did not have the opportunity to retreat. He hacked through them, and in response all the boughs above them trembled as if the trees were shaken by a great gust of wind. The coils unwound from Val, dropping him a short distance to the ground. He landed and woke with a start. The severed vines about him wrapped themselves into tight coils, much like a spider would curl its legs around its egg sac. Hale shivered. He wrapped himself in his own arms, but stopped, for the enclosing sensation was too similar and too reminiscent of what he had just felt while trapped in the trees. He wondered if he could ever be embraced again, or had this forest stolen that from him, along with any sense of time, direction, even daylight? He looked to Val, Cody, then Caitlin, as they gathered close to the elk. Nice work, Val said, panting, his voice empty of the usual bravado. That sword is something. Praise be to Pathus. Caitlin sniffed and wiped tears from her eyes. Cody jumped and grabbed at his neck at an imagined vine returning. Finding nothing, he shook his head and cursed again. They were alive, and Hale knew they were all thankful for it. But there had been a shift. It was as if they could feel it in the very air. They were trespassers, and the forest had turned against them. Chapter 7 Scouts Gail was still coming down from the hills when she came across the stallion. He was a dusty brown, but by his fine coat and broken bridle, she knew he was no Thestos Wild. He moved at a purposeful trot, and thanks to the mist, he was right ahead of her in soot, when the crow gave a cry from her shoulder, and the horse spotted them. Her reflexes got the best of her, leaving no question of whether or not she would try to capture him. In one instance, she was standing in the field, the stallion approaching. The next, she was rolling, 
albeit awkwardly with satchels, swords, and skins, but she knew that to approach upright would spook him. Instead, she came out of the roll, the animal nearly upon her, and popped herself into a standing position. The stallion reared. It couldn't be avoided, but now she was close enough to reach out, extend her hand, and seize the frayed line hanging from the bridle. He was a willful beast, and did not like being restrained again, letting her know with a hard yank of his head that burned her hands with a rope and nearly took her off her feet. She had expected as much, and was braced so that she maintained her balance and gave a firm yank of her own. He quieted after that, recognizing her dominance. She put a hand to his neck and stroked him in response. He was solid, muscular, too large for a mere farm horse. This was a horse of war. No saddle, but with the right persuasion she imagined she might ride him bareback. She abandoned the notion when three riders crested the ridge and turned towards her. They each cut the same profile, wearing ringmail, surcoats, and helms with nasal guards and leather ear flaps. She knew soldiers of the realm when she saw them, and twisted the bridle rope in her hands, the stallion shifting on his feet. She offered no greeting. Perhaps it was a habit from long years as an outlaw. Perhaps it was being a woman among three armed men, even if she was disguised as a boy. But the soldiers did not take an aggressive posture as they came to a stop in a row a few feet away. The one in the middle, a sergeant in the Anton army by the gold crest on his helmet and purple surcoat, spoke. Good morn, young man. You've done king and country a service by capturing this horse. Young man. For now her short hair and martial dress were working. What young girl would be out in such a region alone, unattended anyway? Obliged, she said, pitching her voice low, standing legs apart as she imagined a young man would. You are king soldiers? Headed on a campaign, then? Marching south to aid our sister kingdom, Kareth, in repelling barbarians from the east. Are any of you honorable men in need of a squire? I can fence, shoot, and ride. Good, are you? The sergeant asked, rubbing a spot on the war hammer that hung from a sling on his hip. I can put an arrow in a crow's eye at thirty paces, she said. Not that crow, one of the others said laughing, as Soot landed on the rump of the stallion. You and every other boy from Rivertown are looking for adventure, the sergeant said. Do your mother a favor and go home to her. I already come armed. We can see that, the third one said, as he sidestepped his horse closer to her. He has swords and arrows enough for a regiment. Where's a boy like you get kitted out so? I have a martial-minded father, she said, comfortable sharing the truth. Truly? the sergeant said, and nodded to the third. Ramsey, take the captain's horse. Let's be going. Gail stepped backwards, moving the bridle rope out of reach, the stallion following her. This horse belongs to your captain. Perhaps there is a reward, she said, grasping at straws. The reward is that we will not flog you, the sergeant said. If we had a reward for every stallion led up into these hills by the scent of wild mares and heat, the king's coffers would be empty. Give it here, boy, the closest rider, named Ramsay, growled. Perhaps the captain needs a squire? You try my patience, boy. Ramsay, get the horse. Ramsay pushed forward on his mount as if to trample Gale, but she was too quick. She pivoted, grabbed a fistful of mane, and was up bareback and galloping in the direction of the camp before the soldiers had turned their horses about. Their shouts rose up and carried over the hills in the thick, misty air, but she ignored them, straining to remain on the bouncing back of the stallion and follow the path of parted grass that was the soldiers' trail back to the camp. Lose them in the mist, return to the camp, and find the captain herself, and perhaps she would have an opportunity for work. If nothing else, she could simply slip off the horse and melt into the moving city of non-combatants that lived on the periphery of the army. The stallion was fast, and the sound of the other horses already distant behind Gale. She turned around a bluff and crossed a ridge, only to encounter a new problem. 
two more soldiers, surely part of this same search party, were snapping the reins of their own horses, goading them up the hill in her direction. Her stallion had no desire to rejoin their numbers. He came to a stubborn stop along the ridgeline, his steps stuttering, for the drop on either side was steep. The hesitation was costly. Soot squawked in alarm overhead. Gale turned just as the sergeant came galloping down the hill, rocks tumbling beneath the hooves of his horse. A horse with eyes rolled back in fear as his rider pulled the reins with one hand and lifted his war hammer with the other, just before slamming it into Gale's chest. Chapter 8 Voices We don't sleep until we have to. Val said. We go forward. The jays did not fly on ahead or above them now, but rather perched inside the protection of the elk's crown. Hale walked with his hand on the hilt of Elkhart. It was difficult to shake the feeling now that their presence in the woods was some sort of violation, and that it was only a matter of time before the forest moved again in retribution. When night came, it was sudden, Shadows gathered in the open spaces of the woods like oil-darkening water, then rushed out to consume their party. Hale guessed that it was not even truly night yet. The sun was probably setting, but with its rays cast over the woods and not into them, night emerged from all the places where it had been hiding, behind trees, under leaves, and inside hollows. Along with darkness came the noise— the forest became a racket, first with chirps like crickets, then with howls, and later, even moans. The thunder he had heard before at a great distance returned closer now, and it was that sound more than others that made Hale jump. A few times it sounded just within a stone's throw of them. It was Cody that figured out its source. The trunks of the trees were full of hollow spaces— he was able to reproduce the same sound, knocking on one of the trunks and the roots that flared out to buttress the trees. There is your thunder, Cody said. Likely it's just tree walkers doing their thing. Hopefully, Caitlin said. Val offered no comment on the noise. Actually, he said nothing at all, and his silence was a tacit acknowledgement of the strangeness around them. He followed the elk, and the elk trod, head down and forward, eyes darting, ears twitching, nostrils flaring. Even with the noise drowning their own voices out, Hale was reluctant to add his own to the chorus. It was not the place of trespassers to speak. Along with the noise came movement, creatures skulking through the bushes and overhead in the trees. They saw none, but Hale knew they were there, boars, rats, and the like. He had seen their desiccated bodies in the treetops, wrapped in vines. The temperature fluctuated dramatically. There were pockets of hot, close air, stifling like an attic, then other clearings where it was damp and cold, and their breath rose in clouds. After passing through a particularly cold passage and entering a milder one, Val stopped and suggested that they break for water. Hale and Caitlin almost immediately fell asleep, but this time no harm came of it, for Val and Cody remained vigilant. "'How long did we sleep for?' Caitlin asked as they got up and began to march once more. "'I don't know. It felt like just a few moments, but it could have been longer. My sense of time is all scrambled here,' Hale said. "'It's the noise. It gets in your head,' Cody said. "'You were only out a few minutes.' The hours went painfully on, as Hale continued to walk, drowsiness blurred the line between sleep and wakefulness, dreams and reality. The faces of those creatures strangled in the treetops came back to him, hideous and nightmarish. Dead faces, exposed teeth, empty eyes. He hated them. But eventually, the tone of the noises around them changed. It was the difference between a song shifting from a minor key to a major one— and a lightning of the darkness soon followed. The screeches and hoots subsided and were replaced by the chitters and tweets of creatures of the day, which were still wild and mysterious, but somehow less threatening. 
Day reasserted itself, and although they still dwelt in the deep shade of the woods, the dim daylight of the forest had never seemed so bright to Hale's eyes. The elk brought them to a stop in a clearing, with a floor of green ferns with purple stems. He tore up some of the foliage with his antlers and cleared a space for them to sit. I guess he thinks it's safe to rest, Val said. Aye, I'll take the first watch, Captain, Cody said, walking the perimeter of the clearing. Hale liked the space. The leaves above were green, not the inky color of the leathery leaves in other parts of the forest. As a result, the whole place was cast in emerald shade. The smells were even congenial. The musk was familiar, almost like the air of Warthorn, the forest of his home. Nearby, mushrooms sprouted from a log covered in red moss. The moss, although a strange color, was otherwise no different from moss he had seen on long hikes in the woods with Yana. The same was true of the mushrooms, which were only unique because of their gold caps. Perhaps, had he been raised in Sidon, all this would be normal to him, and Warthorn would be exotic and strange. Sidon surely was mundane, to the gray slug that slimed along the forest floor, weaving between the leaves next to Hale's boot. When he woke, it felt hours later, but the clearing was still cast in a green light. Cody and Caitlin still slept, and Val spread food out on a blanket he had opened over the ferns. Sapphire hopped from the captain's shoulder to the blanket where she searched for crumbs. The elk was off on the edge of the clearing, azure and cyan in his antlers. Hale felt refreshed, but he knew he needed more rest, a good night of uninterrupted sleep. He reckoned that was something he would not have until they reached the end of the forest. If only they could have packed a surplus of it away like the bread, water, and dried fruits they carried. Val woke up the others and the four of them spoke, even joked and laughed over breakfast. It was good to hear those sounds, Hale thought. When they started off again down the road, he felt stronger, braver, the woods less intimidating. This day they heard the sound of creatures passing in the brush alongside them, but Hale told himself these creatures, like the tree walkers, were just curious. Their presence did not bother him much, except when at one point they stumbled into a clearing where some bluish hump-backed rodent feasted on the carcass of another. The live one shot away into the wall of brush. The dead one was something unrecognizable, with bones sprouting from its gaping, bloody carcass. As the light began to fade again, Hale tried to remain hopeful that this night would not be as bad as the last. Val had them stop for something to eat. Fortify us for the night, he said. Hale, again, was not as hungry as he expected. Caitlin encouraged him to have some dried fruit and one of the hard-boiled eggs that was left. Hale forced both down and then could eat no more. He would have preferred sleeping. When they started off again, the shadows were already spreading. Hale could feel his optimism draining away. It was as if the day had not existed at all, so suddenly he felt thrust back into the madness of the angry nocturnal forest. This time, the screeches and howls felt so much closer and more ardent. It was as if he could even sense aggression articulated in their grating noise. He told himself that in a few hours, this would pass. It was something he repeated in his mind, like a snippet of some song stuck there. But even this began to irritate him. Although the thunder no longer disturbed Hale, there were other sounds that took its place. Low moaning like an old man dying, a hissing like a kettle of boiling water, a rattle like a baby's toy, a deep-throated croaking, a mocking, kissing sound. Then there were a variety of calls and barks, that after a time sounded like words he knew. Gripe, gripe, gripe. Kettle, kettle, kettle. Spine, spine, spine. Horse, horse, horse. Hat, cat, hat, cat, hat, cat. Others sounded like words, but words of a different language. Remperwill, remperwill, remperwill. Apes, apes, apes. Morse. The noise was infernal, like hammers beating on his ears, a throbbing that drowned out the rhythm of his own heart. Hale, are you all right? Caitlin asked, 
her own voice just adding to the cacophony in his mind. Fine, just fine, he said. I just want the night to be over. But Hale, it is, she said, stopping. Hale tried to stop, but instead swooned forward. Cody reached forward and caught him. Whoa, the hair prince, he said. Val, I think we ought to rest. Hale was glad for it. He had not noticed, but the leaves were outlined in light. Strange, he thought. The light outside him, which usually was such a balm to his spirit, had failed to affect him this morning. It was as if the darkness of the night had seeped into him, and he had carried it with him into the day. Cody, Val said, I think you are right. Hale slept, then they marched. They ate, then they marched. They each slept for short spells, but then they marched again. They were marching, and at all times Hale felt as if he were sleep-marching. He understood now that the danger of the forest was never starving or dehydration, but the madness that came with the endless trekking, the weariness, the lack of sleep. That night the noises returned again, but this time the shift from day to night seemed less a shock, for as the sounds resumed, Hale realized that they had never left the back of his mind in the first place. They had continued there during the day as well, like an incessant, dissonant song. Perhaps, he thought, if the sounds became monotonous, they might become mundane. Hale marched on. After a few more days of marching, Hale felt swallowed, as if the woods were a great living beast whose maw they had dived into. They still lived only because this beast of the woods was too great and majestic to be bothered by insignificant pests like themselves. Other times, as his spirit yearned for light and his mind for silence, he wondered if he had died. Perhaps they had wandered into the underworld and were now buried alive in catacombs where the feet of the earth stood. Perhaps this was hell. In another day, he could hear the sounds of the night turn into voices. When he first heard their faint whisperings, they were speaking too softly for understanding, but they were definitely speaking to him, calling his name. Hail. In another day he could see them, black on black, weaving amongst the trees, shadows that were soft-footed and slid like ink among the trunks. After a while they were all that was real to him, his friends, the shadows told him, were just props in some play that was silly and childish. He agreed. Then the shadows left, daylight chasing them away. This time, in their absence, he felt a loss. He yearned for them. He was beginning to hate the dawn. Why would one want to exist in the day anyhow? It was night that ruled. He could see that in the trees. He began to resent those creatures of the day, and soon his friends as well. By the stars above, that noise gets into your head, Cody said, red-eyed, weary. It's like my thoughts are coming apart, Caitlin said. How do you cope, Hale? I ignore it, he said, like I wish I could ignore all of you. To Hale, only the nights mattered. Days could be measured by the hard tack that was disappearing, by the lightening water skins. How far had they come? How long had they marched? His memory of the daylight was fading. There was nothing else but shade. During the day, Caitlin tried to lean against him while she slept. He tolerated her touch, pretending to sleep himself, but when he closed his eyes, he only saw those inky shadows. He strained to hear their voices, voices that were perpetually on the edge of comprehension. After one rest break, Cody called to him. Hale, you forgetting something? Hale returned his question with a blank stare. Then Caitlin came up alongside him, carrying his sword and rucksack that he had left behind on the ground. You have not been yourself these past few days, Val said to him once they were underway. Just tired, that is all, Hale said, trying to hide his resentment that anyone was speaking to him at all. Why had he decided to travel with this lot, he wondered. 
how much sooner until the darkness of night would return and the shadows would once again accompany him. All that mattered to him were those nocturnal companions. They did not disappoint. They returned at nightfall, louder now, an insistent chorus. Their numbers had grown, a ring of dancing blackness. This night he could almost reach out and touch them. They flitted right through the elk's antlers, and yet the creature was oblivious, as one is oblivious to an insubstantial shadow passing over his back. Hale was weary, so weary of all this marching, the road going everywhere and never reaching anything, and yet the shadows were jubilant and lively. Their journey to Carith became so pointless to Hale, the endless walking, the progress of the material world, the foolishness of it all became painfully apparent to him. What were they doing in this forest, carrying on as if they were in sun-drenched Warthorn? This was Sidon, realm of shadows. They were fools, complete fools. This was all wrong, and he knew it to be. Yes, yes, a voice whispered to him. Could he answer? Dare he? Would the others notice? Would he ruin the bargain he had with the Watchers? You must leave them, the voices said. You must leave them. Come to us alone. Leave, leave, leave. His disgust rose in him like vomit until the urgency was the same. He turned and darted off the path, crashing through the brush, he heard the others call to him, but their voices were grating on his ears and only reminded him of his need to be away. Now the hissing of the shadows rose in celebratory chorus. He followed their sounds and caught glimpses of their figures, always just darting out of his sight, like a runner that was slightly quicker than he. But he knew, he knew if he only followed, the voices grew louder every moment, they would reward him. He ducked under a low branch. He told them he was coming. He was coming. He ran. His heart was in his throat, his breath thin in his mouth. He felt dizzy, as if he were being lifted up. He felt sick from the exertion. Animals scurried away terrified. He knew they were not just scurrying away from him, but from the watchers. They were foreboding. They were feared here. Of course they were feared here. They were all powerful. They said so in their whispers in his ears. They were all that was real here in the madness of the dark forest, and he was ready to surrender, to become one with them. He had been lonely all his life, he realized, and this was a pain he knew he would never be able to bear. It grew and exploded inside him, making him run with abandon, briars whipping his face. He unsheathed his sword and dropped it at his feet. Now the shades moved closer. They had not liked the sword, he realized now. He could feel the darkness on his body. There was such acceptance here. He was just on the edge of communion. He was almost one with them. He could see their shapes moving and dancing just ahead. Then something else flashed before his face, so bright and white that she eclipsed the darkness. Aurora, Garn's dead daughter, the girl Hale was supposed to heal, skipped and leapt over tree branches. Tiny suns orbited her head, burning brightly against the dark backdrop of the forest. At her feet, flowers appeared that had not been there before. She was incongruous with the gloom of Sidon, and seemed to be there and yet not there at the same time, as if what Hale was seeing was just a vision of her somewhere else, a sunny field after a spring shower. Hale was filled now with the urge to follow her. She cast a glance past him, then continued on. Gone were the signs of sickness in her face. Now her cheeks were rosy and full, her eyes clear. Hale called her name, but she did not hear him. He turned to follow her. But as he did so, he felt a relentless, desperate tugging upon him from the darkness, from the shade. That was where he ought to go, into the darkness. He turned back and started forward. Hale, 
No, he heard Aurora say. So she had seen him. He tried to turn back to her, but could not. He felt himself walking forward, toward the dark, against his own wishes. Hale, stop! This was a new voice. His motion, as compelling as it was, came to an abrupt halt. The voice was clear, in a way the voices of his friends were not. The other's voices had become muffled in the past days. Even his own thoughts had become so. But this voice rang out as clearly as the pealing of a great bell. It was all around him and through him as well. It startled him, like a splinter through his skin, a spear through his body. The darkness he was running into remained before him, standing like a portal, but he realized that it was not the only presence here. There was light behind him. He turned. He saw Aurora standing by and watching him, but she was small compared to the great figure that stood beside her. The woman wore blue and white robes, which floated about her like garments submerged. Her eyes were hazel, but with flecks of auburn about the pupils, like flares of an eclipsed sun. Her shoulders, he knew, were freckled, and he knew her name as if she whispered it to him without speaking. Aurora smiled as if sharing a great secret. Heirs Olee. Mother. At once she was young and old. He could see her as a young girl, in an orange dress dirtied from forays along a muddy stream. A teenager, sweaty in the forge, bent over an incomplete bracelet, a flat strand of chestnut hair across her face, her cheekbones like plump fruit. If he could only touch them. Then she was older, sad, defeated in a birth chamber. Then young again, her face bright, her chest full like an overflowing basket, as his father had seen her. Mother, hail. Aurora told you I was coming. Here of all places, I can show myself. Now, hail, come to us. Do not go back to the shadows. They are empty and full of fear. All they know is lack and wanting. There is nothing for you there. He hesitated. He felt like a child standing in the surf, the drawing of the darkness sucking at him like an undertow, being chided by his mother for wandering too far out into the waves. Some semblance of shame crept back into his consciousness, some memory of who he was and what he truly wanted. He remembered his friends, his father. How could he have left? He reached out for her. As he did, he sensed something malicious and implacable behind him, collapsing. But his mother, Erzo Lee, simply tipped her face upwards and glanced towards the commotion, and it was gone, silenced as if it had never been. They walked hand in hand through the forest for some time, Aurora always at their periphery, humming to herself, taking breaks in her dancing steps to bend down and pick flowers that appeared in her path. Hale was surprised how familiar and comfortable it was, not at all different from his walks with Yana. Everything was pleasant in his mother's presence. The darkness was a swirl of blues and the substance of the things about them, trees, roots, leaves, dirt, was changed. The scents of the forest were different, but he could not figure how. He could not figure much. Reason was remote. Emotion was the most powerful current here. The voices were gone, and Hale understood that this was a good thing. She spoke to him of the dangerous path he had been on, but he had chosen rightly, and she was proud of him. She was so proud of him, she said. But you must be careful. You and your friends are still in grave danger, even with the shadows vanquished. Where are they now? he asked, afraid they would return. In the place they always were, somewhere stuck between life and death. But they will trouble you no longer. You must go forward now. You are safe from the shadows, but you are still in danger as long as you are on this side of the Gillithwane River. Where are you? Hale asked. I am here and I am not here, 
just as these woods are. I don't understand. As well you shouldn't, for you are still part of the world that is waking, which is where you must now return. You will not remember this or me, but you will remember the urgency of your task, and that you must help her. Who? It will be clear to you when you see her. Aurora had appeared again at Erzoli's side, holding Hale's sword. Elkhart glimmered with light, like sun on water. She gave it to Hale's mother, who looked into the depths of its brilliance for some time, as if she saw some vision playing out there. Finally, she lowered it and handed it to Hale. I want to stay with you, Hale said, looking up into the face he knew and yet did not. You cannot, she said with firmness. Go back now, Hale. She needs you. Help her. Everything depends upon it. Everything. Chapter 9 Darid Costland The camp stank of poorly dug latrines, burning middens, and wood smoke from campfires. Even at this early hour, the pathways among the tents were crowded with errand boys, officers, and all manner of tradesmen, cooks, weaponsmiths, rubbing shoulders with soldiers, unshaven, unwashed, and already looking gaunt from leagues of hard marching. The noise was more than a carnival, with officers barking out commands, horses clomping through mud, swords jangling, and feet marching. Gail watched it all with rueful eyes. How easily she could have disappeared in all of it. How easily she could have found work, a place to earn her keep and eat. But now she was mounted on the back of the very stallion she had caught, her chest hurting with every intake of breath, bound with her own length of rope. She looked sidelong at the bloody gash she had left on the face of the sergeant and the ripped bloody sleeve of Ramsay. At least I put up a fight. Not that it had helped her. The blade had always been the answer for her, but against five trained soldiers she had been no match. Perhaps she should not have run. Shoulds are worth shite. Still, she could not shake the niggling sense that she had been impetuous. What had worked in the Eastlands would not work here, a voice, she guessed her better judgment, told her in her head. Soot followed, swooping from tent pole to tent pole, occasionally landing on the banner of the regiment quartered in the nearest vicinity. A tent in each regiment was marked by a flag flapping alongside, the house colors of whatever officer or captain commanded it, just under the colors of the seal of King Talamar, the crossed hammer and sword on a purple-blue field. But they did not stop at any of these tents as Gail expected. Instead, they continued to the center of the camp, to a camp within the camp, marked off by earthen ramparts and wooden palisades. Her bladder burned and her bowels felt loose as they passed the pillaring post where deserters stooped, locked by head and hands in wooden stocks, the remnants of rotting garbage in their hair and beards and at their feet. Where I might end up, she thought. One tent commanded the space of more than any other by its sheer size and towering center pole. By the colors and the banners hanging outside, and the plethora of guards, she knew it to be none other than the king's own tent. Was she to be tried? If so, as whom? A nobody from Rivertown, or did they see through her disguise and recognize her as Avenger Red? She felt a little relief when they turned away from the king's tent to a row of smaller ones behind— these were still stately with ample guards standing by, servants milling about and house colors flapping in the breeze. Nobles, she thought, and officers. Who else could command five men to go search for a horse? They finally came to a stop next to a tent that was out of place among the grander ones. This one was smaller, plain, not unlike that of a regular soldiers or sergeants outside in the camp proper. The colors were distinct as well, for they were green and white, a seal depicting a copper-colored dragon running rampant on a background of green fields and blue sky. The colors of Kareth. 
The sergeant dismounted and stepped around a smoking fire pit and asked for admittance. A low voice replied from within, too muffled for Gail to understand. But the sergeant snapped back the tent flap, shooting her a glare that turned her blood to ice. The cut on his cheek was still wet and weeping. Inside, a quick conversation followed. Gail caught bits and pieces before a long silence. She pictured a fat noble nodding his head, double chins wagging, wearing shining armor never used and boots polished by another's hand. Next, a vision of herself in the wooden stocks at the pillory posts came to mind. The ropes were chafing around her, her chest throbbing from where the hammer had struck her. How had things gone so wrong? The sergeant slapped the flap aside and reemerged, followed by the Corinthian officer whose horse she had recovered, stolen as she imagined the story had been told. He was not what she expected. A mature man who had seen over thirty summers by the creases on his face and strands of silver in his sandy hair. He was freshly shaven, his boots indeed polished, but his half-plate armor was dusty and dented, having seen its share of combat. His sword was sheathed, but by the worn handle she could see it had been wielded often. The cross guard, by contrast, was of the finest make, intricately carved with flourishes, yet empty of the ridiculous jewels one often saw on the swords of nobles. His eyes were piercing, but not without a softness in them. This surprised her, as much did the faint smile lines bracketing his mouth, smile lines that deepened when he looked upon her. So, this is the miscreant, he said in a lilting Corinthian accent. Yes, sir, the sergeant said, the blood still unwiped from the side of his face, left as an indictment against her. The Corinthian nodded, strolling up around the fire pit to take his stallion's bridle and caress his nose. Barnaby go a whiff of the mares and the hills, I imagine, he said, speaking more to the animal than the men. As if to bring his attention back to the matter at hand, the sergeant cleaned his throat. Uh, what shall we do with the boy, sir? The king's justice, as only as good as his mercy, Sergeant Cullen, the Corinthian interrupted. You said he volunteered for duty. Gail met his eyes, wondering if she should answer herself, but the sergeant, Cullen, was quick. He did, but by his size I discounted that. He has weapons, though. Perhaps he stole them one of the men added, his eyes swollen from where she had kicked him when they were tying her up. Not stolen, freely given, Gail said. The Corinthian nodded, assessing her, then the soldiers. And by the looks of the five of you, this boy knows how to use his weapons. There is some fight in him. Sergeant Cullen mumbled something about underestimating the situation, while the other soldiers failed to make eye contact. My own squire is sick with the flocks. I intend to send him home to convalesce. He won't like it much, but we can't have the sickness spreading throughout the camp, lest disease defeat us before we even reach the battlefield in Kerith. Untie him. Return his weapons. We'll see if he can serve as well as he boasts. The skin tightened around Sergeant Cullen's eyes, his chin disappearing into his neck. Sir, are you sure? He attacked us. So he's brave. We need that. My wound? Make up a good story. The tavern wenches will love you for it. The other soldiers could not help but smile and snort. True that, one said. The sergeant's nostrils flared as he reached up, yanked at the knots holding Gail and freed her wrists. You are as wise as you are gracious, my lord, she managed to say. Don't get comfortable the Corinthian said. You will work for three. These men were doing a service for me, and you assaulted them. You owe me a debt, and them an apology. The sergeant's chest inflated, and he stood a little taller. She could have spat in his face, but she decided it best to restrain herself. My deepest apologies and regrets for my impetuousness. Now it was the sergeant who did spit on the ground. She noted with some satisfaction that it was pink with blood. Another warrior on the side of the kingdom is welcome, I reckon. He gave a short bow to the captain and started for his own horse. No, get off my damn horse and into my tent. My breakfast needs making and my armor will not polish itself. 
the Corinthian said, his eyes hard and flinty. She slid off the stallion while her new lord received her belongings from the other soldiers. If you need someone to put him through the paces, we'll be more than obliged, Sergeant Cullen said, turning from his horse. I'll remember that, Sergeant. Yes, sir. The Corinthian narrowed his eyes on the bow, the knives, and the swords, but his expression turned to a scowl when he noticed Gail standing still, rubbing her chest. Didn't you hear me? Inside. She ducked under the flap of the tent into the dark interior, the soldiers' laughter following her. She felt the muscles in her jaw flex, and her hands made a popping noise as she made them into fists. The room was sparse, a cot covered in furs, a shield standing in the corner with a target-like design on it. To her surprise, she noted a small book laying open on the furs, and another, also opened, on the camp table in the center of the room. This was the tent for an officer who held meetings. Four chairs were set around the table. She wondered if the king himself had sat in one. She felt lightheaded at the thought of being so close to royalty, to authority. But whether she saw the king or even lived to see another day would be up to this mysterious officer. The horses trotted away and he strode into the tent, tossing her weapons down on the table and collapsing into the canvas seat of one of the camp chairs. Take a seat, he said, his features now made stark by the faint light coming in from the small opening at the center pole. You are well equipped. Pardon the bluster outside, a show for the men. Please, sit down. The chair creaked beneath her, her weapons within her reach, but she was unsure whether or not she was welcome to take them back. As if reading her mind, the Corinthian nodded. Take them. They are yours. Do you have a name? Alex, she said, surprised that a false one came to mind so quickly. Alex Redbrook. Well, Alex, I am Derrid Cosland, ranger knight in the court of King Owen and Queen Amberlyn. I am in your debt and your service. I am in yours. You returned Barnaby to me. He is a valuable steed when he's not trying to sire colts. Callum told me. You rolled him bareback before you gave the fight to five of the king's own soldiers. I would not say it was a close contest, she said, wrinkling her nose. Still, brave and impressive, especially for a girl. Chapter 10. Storn. Hale opened his eyes and coughed. There was dirt on his face and dust in his nostrils. He was face down. Wherever he was, it was dark, some recess in the woods. Had he been sleeping? He rolled over and saw that his friends were gone. He was alone. How did I get here? His head spun and his heart beat in his chest as panic kindled. He would have stood up and called out for Val and the others, but he heard a strange noise approaching, what he thought to be a deep, animal-like growl. He pressed himself down into the ground, wishing himself invisible. Ahead of him, through a tangle of bushes, he saw a flat space, the road. It was glowing from fire, the light growing closer. Two feet landed lightly right before his eyes, two hideous feet with green leather skin and long black talons. The feet took two steps, then were gone again with a grunt, a clapping noise, and a breeze that eddied the dust on the road. Two more pairs of feet appeared, accompanied by leaping grunts. Then came the clapping, and they were gone, dust settling in their wake. Hale reached beneath himself for his sword and wrapped his hand around the handle. A memory flashed in his mind of someone handing it to him, the blade glowing, a face that was familiar as his own but distinct. But the vision receded like a dream upon waking. The feet were falling from above like rain now. The place was a raucous of giddy grunts and hisses. It sounded like a pig pen. He watched the feet, green, gnarled with those hooked talons, some gleaming in new, others nicked and blunted. A few legs, he noticed, were covered in links of rusting mail that jingled just before the limbs flexed and leapt into the air once more. Not unless they rode on beasts. Those were the prints we found, three-toed and four-toed on the earth. 
He moved on his elbows, peering up through the branches, his own breath disturbing the leaves before his face. He saw nothing, just firelight reflected on leaves. Then suddenly a terrible face landed right before his, and just as it had appeared, it left. He recoiled from the vileness. He had thought such a face could only exist in nightmares, in children's horrid drawings of their most terrible fears. But no, this was real. His mind raced over fields, forests, swiftly flowing rivers and red hills, to a crumbling mind beneath the jagged snow-capped teeth of the Rimkers. Jasmine. He could see her face now, luminous and beautiful as these creatures were hideous. If she could be real, so could they. He had a terrible longing for his friends, but he could not remember how he became separated from them. He tried to recall their journey so far, but his thoughts were interrupted as an entire group of the things landed just on the other side of the hedge, giving him a glimpse of all parts of them. They were horrible and hunched. On their backs snapped leathery black wings that beat like those of bats. Against the light of the torches, the membranes were the color of dirty water with translucent black veins pumping through them. The faces of the things were smashed. Their noses were jutted up like wild boars. Their eyes narrow yellow slits with black pupils that darted like cockroaches scattering from light. Their lower jaws protruded out from underneath their upper ones, with rows of long teeth, misshapen and irregular. Hale thought of a pincushion, overstuffed with pins. The sound they made brought to mind a herd of pigs feeding or fighting over food. A second tangle of the beasts landed before him. This mass consisted of creatures larger than the others. Whereas the smaller ones were about the size of a child, these were the size of men, perhaps shorter, but their shoulders and backs were lumped with muscles. Some of these larger ones even wore bits and pieces of plate armor, Gauntlets over a forearm, plates over a shoulder, but nothing complete, and nothing to encumber the wings on their backs. All the creatures were noisy, laughing and growling. Hale could recognize that the noises they made were regular enough to be speech, but comprehension was impossible. The melee suddenly opened up, and to his horror, he saw a girl— a human girl, kicking and fighting, wearing armor herself that was black like all things in this wood. For the moment, she had kicked her way free. Her leg flailed, but was soon recaptured. Her eyes were blue fire and desperate. She shouted, but he didn't catch any meaning in her words. A hand moved to silence her, green flesh over Rose's lips. Suddenly, her arm flew up, and she punched the claw away. Both legs came free. For a wild moment, it looked as if she would escape. But the creatures were too numerous. Those on the edges pushed inward. For a moment, Hale hoped that the pressing numbers would just cause more confusion and perhaps allow her to flee. This appeared to be the girl's plan as she heaved and kicked the limbs of her captors into one another. Larger creatures tripped over smaller ones, and the smaller ones squealed. Like a fox breaking free of hounds, she burst from the fracas. But in one terrible motion, a smaller creature on the periphery leapt to the height of her face and with an extended limb wrenched her head backwards. Others quickly seized her. When the first one withdrew, three deep gashes gaped open across the side of her face. Hale shuddered. As he watched, the commotion of the pack increased. The figures split into two groups— there were the creatures holding down the girl who had gone still, except for her heaving chest. Her hair was stuck to her face by blood, which dribbled down onto the ground, the smaller green creatures licking it up, coating their tongues in dirt. The larger gray menaces knocked them away, the way hunters might kick at hounds interfering with their kill. Other gray members of the pack were occupied with attacking something else— Hale realized it was one of their own numbers, a smaller green imp. After a brief resistance, they held this unfortunate creature up by his arms. Hale could see that even among the smaller creatures, this was one of the smallest. His yellow eyes were wide with terror. His legs kicked helplessly as they held him aloft. His claws shone with the fresh red blood drawn from the girl's face. 
unrecognizable speech passed among all the creatures, but Hale thought he could understand well enough. Whomever they were taking her to wanted her unblemished. The guttural sounds of debate stopped abruptly with a motion from the tallest of the gray creatures. His armor was more complete than the others. The swing of his sword had been too quick and subtle for Hale to notice, but he saw the result. The green creature who had cut the girl's face swung free from one of his captors. The captor still holding him dropped him to the ground. The other appeared somewhat surprised to suddenly be holding a useless limb, a limp green claw. It threw the limb into the forest, sending it crashing through leaves and branches to land next to Hale. The smell from the severed claw was powerful, like sweating pigs or the guano of a cave full of bats. There was also a coppery smell that Hale took for blood. The column started forward again. He closed his eyes and whispered a prayer to any god listening that the creatures would not notice him. The girl was already entwined in the burly arms of the gray things. They waited for the other creatures to go ahead, then leapt off into the air themselves. Hale was left listening to the sound of his own desperate breathing. But there was another sound, a gasping, hissing whining. The small, maimed imp was still there, and Hale could see it now. He was searching the road for the very claw, his claw, that the gray creature had cut off as his punishment. Hale was surprised to feel some sympathy for the beast, as he would feel, he guessed, for any wounded animal, as this one certainly was. The creature moved about, cradling his severed stump, his snout sniffing the air for its scent. He was moving closer. Hale reached down, overcame his own revulsion, and seized the severed claw. He pushed the thorns and bracken aside with Elkhart, then broke through onto the road. The creature looked up from its search and froze, its eyes wide, its mouth of needle-like teeth agape. He raised his good arm, its talons extended, but the wounded creature looked more pathetic than intimidating. Hale held up the severed hand. This elicited another hiss from the beast, before his legs bowed and he leapt upon Hale. The attack was too quick for Hale to think. He simply shuffled backwards, dodged a swipe of the creature's remaining claw, and while it was off balance, he struck the severed stump with the flat of his sword. The thing howled and bent over his wounded arm. Hale had sighs on his side and kicked the beast, sending it tumbling across the road. He lowered the point of Elkhart at the imp's neck and held it there. They remained rooted in place, their bodies shaking. Out of instinct, Hale spat, Stay back. It nodded and stepped backward, its eyes on the claw Hale still clutched. An amazing thought occurred to Hale. Can you understand me? It nodded again. Hale could guess from the sounds he heard the creatures making before that they would not be able to make the sounds required for human speech. But if they had their own language, was it so unlikely that they could know his, at least enough to understand it? You can understand my language. The creature's eyes widened with questioning. Then he nodded again and hissed. He would have to keep his sentences simple, Hale decided. Can you speak it? He shook his head no. I didn't think so, Hale mumbled to himself. Are they going to kill the girl? The creature nodded and hissed a noise that almost sounded like, Yes. Hale glanced to the side of the road and noticed a curtain of the same black vines that had come close to strangling him and his friends. He swept his sword past them, and they fell limp as before. Elkhart still held some property that rendered them inert, at least for a short time. With a second swing, he cut down a couple. He snatched one up as it began to curl into itself and applied it as a tourniquet to the severed claw, then held it up, swinging it in front of him. You want it back? The creature nodded. Then take me to her. The creature made a choking noise and rubbed at his eyes with his good wrist. He swung his head to and fro as if locked in a debate with himself, looking up to eye his severed limb where it now hung swinging from Hale's belt. Finally, he waddled over to some of the severed vines, snatched one up and wrapped his own bleeding stump in one, and shook his head in the direction where the horde had passed. Hale was about to follow, 
when a shape broke through the foliage on the side of the road. The imp arched his back and the hair on his shoulders rose up on end. Hale readied his sword as a blade cut through the latticework of branches. Val stepped through the gap and into the road. Hale! Val! By the stars, what is that thing? came Cody's voice from behind. Not a moment after, the elk leapt past and charged the monster, his rack of antlers lowered. The creature snapped his wings and took refuge in the branches of a tree. Caitlin emerged onto the road next, shrieked upon seeing its hunched shape and beady eyes. But just as quickly, she moved to Hale's side and embraced him, the jays accompanying her, landing on his shoulders and head. We thought you were lost, she said. I was, Hale said and turned to Val. Val, I'm sorry I ran. I, I was hearing voices. I somehow lost my mind. And now, Val said, taking his eyes off the beast to study Hale. I feel like they are gone, but I don't know why. What is this thing, and why do you have its hand? Caitlin asked. I don't know. I saw more of them, dozens. They have a girl, a human girl. They are going to kill her. Then, without knowing why, he added, We have to save her. Hold on, Val said, his hand up. First you run off, claim you lost your mind, heard voices. Now you want us to try to rescue some girl? How did she even end up this deep in the wood? I don't know, but he told me they would kill her he said, pointing to the treed imp. Like they will do to us if we interfere, Cody said. This thing can talk? Val asked, incredulous. Sort of. It can understand us. The creature made another long hiss that sounded like a mangled, yes. The elk curled its lip and gouged at the dirt with his hoof. Val appeared for the first time since entering the woods, overcome. He knelt down, and rested his head on one hand, the other holding his sword pointed up at the creature. Hale was afraid perhaps he was struck with the battle sickness again, but after a moment he realized it was just weariness. Caitlin spoke up from beside Hale. If there is a girl in danger, we have to help her. Hale said nothing, instead studying Val who rubbed his eyes with the heels of his hands. I don't know anything anymore. I thought we had lost you, Prince. Now we find you, and you suggest driving into a den of these things to save a girl I can't even be sure you saw. I did see her. And you heard voices, too. I'd never believe you if I had not heard them as well. You too? Hale asked. While we are confessing here, I could have sworn I've seen things moving in the bushes. Things like shadows, Cody said. I'll looked to Caitlin, who shrugged. I've seen, heard nothing. But you've had blessed more sleep than the rest of us, Cody said. She also wears a magical band, Hale remembered. These woods can turn a man mad. Given enough time, I don't doubt they would do the same to womanfolk, Val said with a nod to Caitlin. I'm tired. Tired of pushing forward against the current of this place. Tired of it beating on my brain like a hammer. Maybe it is time we fought back. Caitlin is right. This girl needs our help. But I swore an oath to protect life. You all did not. If it counts for much, I'd be fine leaving her to fend for herself, Cody said. We need to get our own hides safely through this place. But, Captain, you know I'll follow. Aye, and I don't take that lightly. Hale does this thing have a name. The creature adjusted its grip on the tree branch and made a guttural noise that sounded like Storn. All right, Storn, Val said, getting up. Lead the way.